right, good evening. Let's see how high I can get this without uh, starting to screech a little bit there. There we go. Uh, so welcome to tonight's campfire. Obviously somewhat minus the fire, unfortunately. Uh, sorry about that, my uh, fire making skills kind of failed me today. Um, but uh, we are going to uh, continue on regardless. Uh, so my name is Joseph Tingley. I'm a seasonal park ranger here at Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, this is my uh, third summer here. I'm also a uh, graduate student at uh, West Virginia University uh, when I'm not uh, here at the park during the summer season. And uh, tonight's campfire program is going to be talking about the psychological effects of war, what today we might term as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're going to be talking about how while we often do not think of the civil war as a war where people do suffer from these types of conditions, nonetheless, there are going to be people who are going to struggle mentally both during and after the war as a result of their experiences, just like today and just like in subsequent wars. So first things first, I want to start with a quick story. Captain Henry T. Owen, he's pictured right here, he's a member of the 18th Virginia here at Gettysburg. He is among those soldiers who makes Pickett's charge and manages to survive and return to Seminary Ridge. In December of 1863, he writes to his wife and tells her he has been tormented by dreams where he relives these experiences he had here at Gettysburg. He describes fighting the great battle over again, and he sees a shadow which morphs into an angel. This angel is going to tell him that they are his guardian angel that is what spared him here on the fields of Gettysburg. He's going to tell his wife that he woke up sobbing from this dream, night after night after night, for months and months after the Battle of Gettysburg, wondering why he had been spared while so many of his comrades had fallen here at Gettysburg. Another Confederate veteran is going to write from a soldier's home after the war. He writes a poem which goes, that was luck, but as soon as they mustered us out, I lost the old vigor and wandered about. Somehow I'm a failure and scarcely know why, doomed to live when it's harder to live than die. So as I said, there are men during the American Civil War who are going to suffer from, again, what today we would label as post-traumatic stress disorder. However, many of them are going to struggle to make sense of this. Family members are going to note that these men come home changed, but they don't quite understand why. There is very little understanding, as we'll talk about tonight, of mental illness, and it's very little understanding that what these men go through is not something that they are simply going to be able to push past when they return home. So before I go much farther, uh, I do want to just pause here and kind of make a public service announcement. We are going to be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder what today we again would call PTSD. However, this is not an, a very easy topic to talk about. It's also not an easy topic to listen to. So if at any point anybody decides that they've heard enough and don't want to proceed any further, I will not be offended. I get that this is a very tough topic for many, many people. So with that being said, it is also important to rec recognize the limitations of the topic that we are discussing. This PTSD does not come about, the uh, designation, the diagnosis, does not come about until the 1980s and 90s. So for this reason, this is a very imperfect uh, methodology that we're looking at here. We're trying to diagnose men who lived 156 years ago with a condition that only comes out in the 80s and 90s, that we really only truly understand. There are no medical records that we can access. While it say, may seem uh, ridiculous, the HIPAA law, which prohibits the release of medical records, still applies to historic medical records. So for that reason, it is very hard to find information. In addition, what we're often left with is the worst case scenarios. The cases in which soldiers commit suicide, cases in which they have to be institutionalized and committed to some sort of mental health facility. Most men of the American Civil War do go on to live perfectly normal lives after the war, at least on the surface. A lot of these men are going to struggle very much in private, but oftentimes 
these types of stories are not as common in the records that we have. But, as I mentioned at the start of this program, these men are not the first to suffer in this way. The history of war neurosis has a very long, has very deep roots. Reports of neurosis date back as far as the Byzantine period. However, this was not seen as, uh, as much as on a larger scale. If we think it is hard to find records of men who were suffering from post-traumatic stress during the American Civil War, imagine trying to find some from the Byzantine period. However, there are going to be isolated accounts that are going to suggest that this has very, very deep roots in history and probably dates back to the beginning of warfare itself. When these are noted, they aren't really noted for what they are. It's oftentimes simply noting that these men are breaking down under the pressure of combat. It could be any number of things, but it does suggest that this does have uh, deep roots. Obviously, we think of this in terms of shell shock during the First World War, and that's going to be the first time that it's ever really recognized for what it is. Both the United States Army and the British Army are going to begin treating this. However, all of this is going to date back to the Civil War. So, before we can talk about what the treatment of these illnesses that these men are suffering from at the time of the Civil War, we must first understand what exactly the study of mental illness looks like prior to the American Civil War. As you can imagine, it looks a little bit different than it does today. The field of psychiatry does not exist during the uh, American Civil War. It is not really even in its early stages. In fact, psychiatry is really only coming into uh, the situation at the uh, kind of midway through the First World War. So this is still a long ways off. In the early Republic, in early America, so the 1700s, you're going to be dealing a lot with family members who are going to be mentally ill. There is no type of facility to send these people to. It's going to fall to the family of that individual to take care of them. And of course, when I say take care of them, I mean, of course, essentially hide them from you. This is something that it is not very, uh, it's not something that you talk about publicly, that you have a mentally ill relative. This can affect everything from your social standing to your uh, marriage prospects for your children, your, the standing of your family and the community, all of this can be affected if it is heard that you have a mentally ill family member. For that reason, the early treatments, and I'm using that term extremely loosely, is going to be nothing more than hiding them from view. Did you remember hit the record on your phone? No, I didn't. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this gentleman can uh, get me uh, the recording. So, as we get into the 19th century, so the 1800s, things are going to get, begin to change a little bit. All of a sudden, we are now having facilities that are specifically designed to deal with the mentally ill. However, just like these facilities, uh, just like uh, families are hiding these members from view, family members from view, <laughs> this is going to be very similar to what you're going to see from these early facilities. These are going to be known as asylums, or more commonly as madhouses. So these are going to be essentially prisons. And much of the same things that you'd expect from a prison are going to be used here in this facility. So for instance, solitary confinement is going to be a method of punishment for breaking the rules of the facility. Troublesome patients are simply going to be locked away in solitary confinement, and restraints are going to be very, very common. Now, of course, what you think naturally is that because we, uh, because psychiatry is beginning to emerge and we're starting to treat the mentally ill, that's what leads to the formation of these asylums. However, the opposite is actually true. The first asylums are actually going to lead to the beginnings of psychiatry. Because these people are essentially left here, locked away, meant to be forgotten, it gives doctors pretty much free license to experiment however they please. As you can imagine, they're going to take full advantage of this, and they are going to begin trying different methods of treating the mentally ill. Some early treatments 
as I said earlier, are going to be a lot different than what we might think of today. Most of the time, these treatments are trying to treat something physical. They believe that there is a physical explanation for mental illness. <laughs> so these are going to be some early methods of treating the mentally ill. The first one of these, this one right here, is called a sensory deprivation chair. Essentially, it is a chair that the patient will be strapped into here. And then a box essentially is put over their face and head so that they are getting no visual and no auditory stimuli. They are then put in a dark, quiet room. And as you can see from the bucket that is built into this chair, they are left there for a very long period of time. What they're trying to do is they believe that mental illness is the result of an overstimulated mind. They feel that if they can essentially cut off all stimuli, this will lead to the cure of their patient. The other method they are going to employ is going to be this lovely looking device right here called a spinning chair. They, a lot of what they believe causes illness during this time period and years leading up to the Civil War is going to be something called humoral theory. They believe that there are different fluids in the body that are the cause of mental illness. So they believe that if we spin you in basically a barrel at a very high rate of speed, we may get those humors going in the right direction and essentially cure that patient of their mental illness. As you can probably imagine, these didn't work so well. There is no thought given to, hey, maybe we should talk to our patient. It is going to be a very, very mechanical method of treating them. Another great uh, part of the system of the asylum is going to be the misuse of this system. This system is going to be used as a threat. Wives are going to threaten, uh, excuse me, husbands are going to threaten wives with this, saying that if you do not do what I want you to, I will commit you to an asylum. Some husbands will have their wife committed for no other reason that they found a mistress that they would rather spend time with. While this seems absolutely ridiculous and absolutely horrible, this does happen. Men are going to commit their wives for no other reason that they want to be rid of them. The other problem with this system is that if that person who commits you to that <laughs> asylum leaves and say gets into a carriage accident or dies of illness shortly after, guess what? You're probably not going home ever. Because the same person who commits you to this asylum must be the same person to get you out. Therefore, if that person dies on their way home from committing you, you're probably going to live the rest of your life in that facility regardless of your actual mental state. As the 19th century progresses and we get closer and closer to the Civil War, there are going to be beginnings of reforms. We're going to move toward a little bit more of something called the atmosphere of cure. Facility, facilities that are meant to be asylums are going to be designed specifically to promote airflow and access to sunlight. They believe that this type of environment, this healthy type of environment, will help to cure these patients. However, things like those spinning chairs and restraints and solitary confinement are still going to be very much in use, use prior to the American Civil War. So mental illness in society is also how it is perceived by the average person is also going to play a role in how these men are treated. By the time of the Civil War, there is very limited understanding of mental illness, as you may have gathered from the type of treatment that is being employed. So, oftentimes, people who are suffering from mental illness are thought simply to be mentally weaker. They are going to be thought that they are essentially responsible for their own illnesses. You're thought to be essentially morally inferior if you are suffering from a mental illness. Other things that they believe cause mental illness are going to be, among other things, excessive masturbation. So this is the type of things that they believe are causing mental illness. So if you have a mental illness, it's something wrong with you. You did something wrong. There is something naturally inferior about you. So this is the type of environment 
that the men of the American Civil War, who are going to very understandably struggle with the effects of war, are going to be introduced very quickly into. In addition, mental illness was thought to be a female disease. It's thought to be mostly women who suffer from something that is usually coined as hysteria. So again, these men are going to be thought of as less than men. If they are suffering from a mental illness, they are thought to be less than men and failing at their duty as a member of Victorian society. So, if you're a soldier during the American Civil War who begins to show symptoms of mental illness, your care is going to fall to an army surgeon. Now, while the U.S. Uh, while the uh, medical services during the American Civil War are going to undergo a lot of advancements, and there's going to be a lot of improvements made in the treatment of soldiers, mental illness is not an area where they're really going to advance very far. Most of these doctors and surgeons have absolutely zero experience dealing with mental illnesses prior to the American Civil War. So, they're going to have a very difficult time trying to treat these men. Army surgeons are mostly going to label cases, again, of what today we would probably coin, uh, recognize as post-traumatic stress disorder as something called nostalgia. This condition was a term that was long used to describe severe hope, homesickness and despair. Soldiers suffering nostalgia often became listless and emaciated and often stopped eating, which could often lead to their death. One such case was Private Ezra Bingham of the 161st Ohio, who, to be fair, was acknowledged to, quote, not be a happy soul, end quote, even before the start of the war. However, his military service seems to have pushed this over the edge. Very quickly, he is going to stop talking with his fellow soldiers. He's going to cease eating. He's going to be sent to the hospital because he simply cannot get out of bed in the morning because he is so weak from malnutrition. He's going to spend some time in a hospital where his condition is going to continue to deteriorate. He is actually going to end up dying as a result of this condition. Today, we'd probably recognize this as a very severe case of depression. However, back then, it's going to be labeled as nostalgia. They believe that these soldiers are simply homesick, which to be fair, many are. Most of the men who are going off to war during the American Civil War are in their 20s. At this time in history in the United States, when you are born, if you are most likely not going to travel more than 50 miles from your home at any point in your life. So all of a sudden, these men are very far from home under conditions that they could have never foreseen before. So this is going to be its own kind of trauma. Very few men are really going to receive discharges for nostalgia. The treatments are usually essentially shaming the patient into, quote, snapping out of it, essentially. Reinstilling in them the urge to fight. While this may seem barbaric, the U.S. Army is going to use much the same uh, method during World War I to try and get its shell shock soldiers to go back to the front lines. So, these men are essentially going to be labeled as less than men and told that they have to return to the fighting. Many of these surgeons believe that the best treatment they can give these men is the excitement of an active campaign. So men who might already be suffering the effects of mental illness as a result of combat, a lot of surgeons are going to think that the best thing for them is to send them back to combat. Another thing that is going to emerge is many of these men are going to be accused of cowardice. I, Victorian ideals of ma masculinity are going to state that as a man and an American, you must do your duty and serve in the army. Anyone who is not able to do that is less than a man and pro most likely a coward. So this is going to get wrapped up a lot in this as well, and threats of execution for men who claim to be suffering from some sort of mental illness are not going to be uncommon. Fast forwarding to World War I, there are at least five cases in which we know of that British soldiers were executed during World War I who were suffering from shell shock. And these are just the ones we know about. 
So while the surgeons of the Civil War could be very harsh on men seeming to be suffering from, again, what today we might call post-traumatic stress, they themselves are not going to be immune to it. What these surgeons are dealing with is unlike anything that anyone has ever seen before. Prior to the Civil War, less than 1% of practicing doctors and surgeons have experienced dealing with traumatic wounds like the ones we're going to see, be seeing on the battlefields of the American Civil War. They're going to be working oftentimes for hours and hours on end. Here at Gettysburg, about 650 surgeons are going to be dealing with about 21,000 wounded men who have been left on the battlefield. That comes out to about 31 patients per surgeon. While that may not seem like a lot, it's important to consider that that number of 650 is total. It's the total amount of surgeons who will be in Gettysburg during and well after the battle. So many of these surgeons are dealing with far more than that. Obviously, the men who are brought to these surgeons are in a great deal of pain, and again, there are just so many of them. Many of the surgeons who arrived here on Gettys at Gettysburg on around July 4th are not going to stop working until around July 8th or maybe even 9th. So they are working for four, maybe even five days without a rest. For this reason, it is not altogether surprising that stories of surgeons breaking under this strain are not uncommon. One of these is going to come from Carl Schertz, who's a division commander with the 11th Corps here at Gettysburg. He's going to tour one such hospital right after the battle ends. He's going to write, the surgeon snatched his knife from between his teeth, where it had been while his hands were busy, wiped it rapidly once or twice across his blood-stained apron, and the cutting began. The operation accomplished, the surgeon would look around with a deep sigh, and then next. And so it went on, hour after hour, while the number of expectant patients seemed hardly to diminish. Now and then, one of the wounded men would call attention to the fact that his neighbor, lying on the ground, had given up the ghost, waiting his turn, and the dead body was then quietly removed. Or a surgeon, having been long at work, would put down his knife, claiming that his hand had grown unsteady, and that this was too much for human endurance hysterical tears not seldom streaming down his face. Accounts like this are not going to be uncommon. Many soldiers in the American Civil War are going to describe being brought to Civil War surgeons, and many of them are going to be openly weeping in the midst of their work. Part of this is surely simply mental and physical exhaustion. However, after seeing all of this and so much of it, it is hard to believe that these men could not have been permanently affected in some way by what they see. <clears throat> Surgeons are not going to be the only ones of the medical field who are going to be affected. Nurses as well are going to speak of being unable to forget what they have seen on these battlefields. Mary Chestnut, pictured here, is going to write, I can never again shut out the view the sights I saw there of human, uh, of human misery. I sit thinking, shut my eyes, and see it all again. So, these individuals who are tasked with the medical care of these men are also suffering from this, the effects of, this, uh, of these scenes. When the First World War breaks out, the United States is dealing with more and more of these cases, and at the end of the war, they're going to commission a report. And in this report, they're going to find from the statistics they've kept that the type of fighting that their men are exposed to is going to determine the number of patients they are going to be seeing at any given time. If it is a time during the war where there's very active fighting, a very quick moving front, they're going to see a lot fewer casualties. If they are mired in those trenches under heavy artillery, unable to do very much but sit and wait, they are going to see a lot more cases of war neuroses. So from this, we can assume that the type of combat that the Civil War soldier is seeing is also going to have an effect on how they are reacting to these conditions. 
So what exactly does Civil War combat feel like or look like? Most of the injuries that are going to be caused during the American Civil War are going to be the result of small arms fire. That is, muskets. Rifles fired by soldiers. However, technology has allowed these rifles to get more and more accurate, while tactics have these armies still fighting at very close range, sometimes within 50 or even 60 yards of each other. Meanwhile, they are all carrying rifles that they can kill each other effectively with at about 100 yards. So in these battle lines where these men are standing shoulder to shoulder, men are falling on either side of some of these men, leaving many of them to question, why was I spared? In addition, you're going to have very new technology in terms of artillery. You're now going to have very accurate artillery. In addition, we're going to have the first reliable exploding ordnance. So artillery shells that can explode either on impact or above enemy infantry. And this is going to cause extremely violent wounds. Reports of men being struck by people in their own units flying body parts that have been severed from them are not going to be uncommon. This is going to be extremely violent and extremely graphic fighting. One Vermont soldier, Edward H. Ripley, is going to describe such an experience while fighting at Fort Harrison. He writes that he was standing behind an artilleryman when he was, quote, dashed in the face with a hot steaming mass of something horrible. He writes later, I thought my head had gone certainly this time. A staff officer happened to have a towel with which he cleaned away the disgusting mass from my face and opened my eyes. Unbuttoning my saber belt and throwing open my blouse, I threw out a mass of brains, skull, hair, and blood. As I opened my eyes, the headless trunk of the artilleryman lay between my feet with the blood gurgling out. These types of accounts are going to be very, very common. In addition to the trauma of the battlefield, there is the trauma of everyday camp life. Most soldiers during the American Civil War are not going to die on battlefields. They are going to die as a result of disease. Diseases that today would have been easily treatable. About 40,000 men during the American Civil War are going to die of diarrhea alone. So, as you can imagine, this alone is going to be traumatic. These men are going to be living in these camps and all around them every day. People are dying as a result of disease. I mentioned that report that the Army does at, during, after World War I, which they find that soldiers who can do nothing to prevent their fate, who are sitting in trenches being shelled, are going to be the most susceptible to shell shock. Here, they can't even see what it is that is causing these deaths. It is an invisible enemy. So this alone is going to be extremely traumatic for these men. In addition, in addition, the way in which these regiments are going to be organized during the American Civil War is going to add to this. Most of these regiments are organized within individual counties within your state. So the person who is in the same company as you is usually from the same county. They might be from the same town. You might have grown up together. You might, your families might know each other. So if that person dies on the field of battle, chances are you're right next to them. If they're dying in camp of some form of disease, you're probably in the next tent over. So all around them, these are not just people that they may have met a few months ago or even a year ago. These are the people they may have known their entire lives. So that too is going to cause extreme trauma. Well, it seems unlikely that any of these men could deal with these types of traumas throughout this war and re uh, return home completely as they were before. As I said at the start, most soldiers do return home and live fairly normal lives after the war. Those who have to be institutionalized, those who perhaps commit suicide later on, are in the minority. However, 
there are still quite a number of them. So let's say that you're a soldier who your experiences during this war are going to be bad enough that you have to be institutionalized, that you can no longer live on your own. The place where you would most likely end up is the government hospital for the insane, called St. Elizabeth's, just outside Washington, D.C. This hospital was established in 1852, and it's the first federally run facility for the mentally insane. And during the Civil War, this is where mentally ill soldiers and veterans are going to be sent. The soldiers who are brought to this facility are often going to remain there for the rest of their lives. One of these men is going to be John Hilt. He is a member of the 1st Michigan Volunteer Infantry, Company K. He was a laborer in Ann Arbor, Michigan before the war. And shortly after the Civil War begins in 1861, he is going to enlist. He gets his first taste of combat at the Seven Days Battle in Virginia in the summer of 1862. He's later going to be wounded in the arm, and unfortunately he's going to have to have that arm amputated. He's going to survive his physical wounds, but immediately... <laughs> <laughs> so John Hill is going to go directly from the general hospital where he is going to be treated for his physical wounds directly to St. Elizabeth's. And he is going to spend the rest of his life in that facility. And in fact, he never actually leaves. To this day, John Hill is buried on the grounds of St. Elizabeth's. He's going to die there in 1911 with $18 to his name having never left that hospital. His family, after he is committed, is going to write several times to the hospital asking for information. For this reason, we know that he is diagnosed with something called acute mania. They describe him as withdrawn, apathetic, and occasionally violent, even going so far as to hit other patients. As his family will know, prior to his service, Neither he or anyone in his family has, an ex has any type of history with mental illness. So they are going to be begging for answers to, to questions that these doctors do not have the answers to. They do not know why John Hill goes insane. Once again, today we might infer that perhaps his wartime experiences had something to do with it. It's not just going to be individuals that are going to suffer higher rates of post-traumatic stress. And sometimes we're going to be able to see entire regiments that because of the severe stress that the members of that regiment have been placed under, that are going to show signs of some sort of mental illness following the war. The 16th Connecticut is going to be one of these regiments. It was officially mustered into service in 1862, and it uh, receives very little training before it is thrown right into the Battle of Antietam. They are engaged for no more than a few minutes, but they are going to sustain about 25% casualties. One veteran will remember, we were murdered. So these men are going to start their military careers in an extremely violent, extremely bloody way on the fields of Antietam. In April 1864, the regiment is captured in Plymouth, North Carolina, and they are going to be sent to the infamous Andersonville prison camp. Here the men of the 16th are going to experience some of the worst conditions and treatment of the American Civil War. Sergeant Robert Kellogg is going to remember the scene as they enter this prison. As we entered the place, a spectacle met our gaze which almost froze our blood. Our hearts failed us as we saw what used to be men, now nothing more but skeletons, covered with filth and vermin. God protect us. He alone can bring us out of this awful mess. Many men of the 16th are going to die in Andersonville prison. Those that return home, according to their families, are never going to be quite the same ever again. Alfred Avery, 
is said to have already been quite traumatized by his experiences at Antietam. His family is going to write that he was more or less irrational as long as he lived. William Hancock is going to come back from the war, according to his sister, broken in mind and body. Many of the surviving regiment are going to commit suicide. Others are going to find themselves, like John Hilt, institutionalized as a result of their wartime experiences. Even outside of the 16th, however, there are going to be those veterans who decide that they cannot bear the strain anymore, and many are going to commit suicide. We unfortunately do not know the exact number. <laughs> the only way we know about a lot of these is through newspaper reports and family accounts. Not all of these are going to be published in newspapers, however. Once again, having a mentally ill family member, even at this time, is not something you publicize. One of these men is going to be Private Charles Lindemann. He is going to be a member of the 48th Pennsylvania. He's only 15 when the war starts, but he enlists as soon as he is able in 1864. He will see intense fighting at the Wilderness and Spotsylvania. At Spotsylvania alone, the regiment is going to lose 130 men of the regiment, killed and wounded. He is going to be one of those wounded. He's going to receive a mild wound to his right cheek. He will recover, after, uh, however, shortly after rejoining the regiment, he is going to fall ill. He is eventually going to be discharged. In his discharge, it states that Charles Lindemouth took a severe cold on the picket line and was unwell for some time, until at length he lost his speech and has become unfit for duty for the last six months. Worth, worth noting that during the First World War and even today, loss of speech or a speech impediment is going to be a common symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. Whether it is entire, entirely related is unclear. Again, there is a certain amount that we do have to guess with and make educated uh, assumptions with. However, he is going to survive the war and he does return to Pottsville. He does get married. He's going to have a few kids. However, in November 1893, his condition is continuing to worsen and he is going to apply for a pension from the United States government. He's going to claim that he has anxiety, general fatigue, weakness, headaches, depression, all as the result of his wartime illness. In a very rare occurrence after the American Civil War, his pension request is going to be denied. A family priest is going to write to the War Department saying that this is very much needed. However, on December 15th, 1894, before a response to that letter is going to arrive, he is going to try and kill himself by cutting his own throat at the local Grand Army of the Republic Post Hall. The local newspaper is going to report a veteran attempt suicide. At noon today, groans were heard from the loft above the Gallon Post, number 23, GAR of this place. An investigation was made and a man was found lying on the floor, steeped in blood. The man was found to be Charles Lindemouth, a veteran of the late war. He had cut his throat with a common pocket knife. The cut is likely to end his life. Lindemouth's brain has been affected for some time. He was a brave soldier and served all through the war. Now again, we're drawing some conclusions from very little, but the fact that this newspaper account goes out of its way to mention that he was involved in the war might be might speak to the fact that there was some understanding that perhaps his suicide and his service in the war were related. So, so far this evening, I've given you some cases in which there's a, some evidence to suggest that men were suffering from mental illness as a result of their experiences in the war. You may have noticed that most of these men have been private soldiers, enlisted men. However, officers are not immune to this type of illness. Unlike today and in later wars, even generals are going to be right in the middle of everything. They are very close to the front lines. Colonels are leading regiments right on the line. 
So just because you have a higher rank does not mean you are going to escape the same sights and awful conditions that the men under you are going to be dealing with. For this reason, there are going to be many cases in which officers are going to suffer from these illnesses. Renald McKenzie is going to be one of these. He graduates from the United States Military Academy at the top of his class in 1862. Here at Gettysburg, he's going to serve on General Meade's staff. After the battle for his service here, he will be promoted to major. He will be wounded six times in total throughout the American Civil War. He will continue to rise through the ranks, and he will soon be identified as one of the most promising young officers of the war. In fact, even General Grant will say that he has a lot of respect for Renald McKenzie and believes that he is one of the greater officers in this army, saying that he had won his way up the command of the Corps before, its, uh, before the close of the war. This he did upon his own merit and without influence. So even Ulysses S. Grant is going to have a lot of respect for Renald McKenzie as an officer. He is going to remain in the Army after the war, and he will fight in the Indian Wars. He's going to be wounded again in 1871. This will make his seventh time being wounded. This time he's going to be struck by an arrow to the thigh. However, it seems that by this time, his wartime experiences are beginning to catch up with him. He's going to suffer a nervous breakdown in 1881. However, he is going to return to duty. After, after he returns to duty, however, some of his officers, are, fellow officers, are going to begin to notice that there is something wrong with him. They will describe him as irritable, irascible, exacting, sometimes erratic, and frequently explosive. And in December of 1883, his superior officers are forced to react. He's going to be given a medical discharge in 1884, and he's going to be committed to an asylum in New York City. He will spend the last several years of his life in and out of various mental hospitals. He will die in January of 1889 at the home of his sister. Other officers are going to have similar experiences. Show of hands, how many people have heard of Governor K. Warren? Good. It's not just going to be officers who we've never heard of who are going to suffer from these types of illnesses. Governor K. Warren, who is known here at Gettysburg for being the man who saves the left flank of the Union line here on Little Round Top, whose statue now sits on this battlefield, is going to be, there is going to be evidence suggesting that he is suffering from some sort of post-traumatic stress. Warren does have uh, symptoms, can, uh, excuse me, he does have symptoms of what, again, today we would probably call depression prior to the war. But again, as in many cases, the war is going to slowly worsen these conditions. He's still going to be generally effective in his duties. Later in the war, he's going to be commanding the 5th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. However, according to many, his temper is going to become extremely volatile. He's also going to begin drinking very, very heavily at times, to the point where he needs fellow officers to tell him what he's been doing while he's been drinking. However, on the surface, he will not ask for help. It is only to his wife that he will confide his feelings that he, it, there is something wrong with him. <coughs> he writes to her, I repine a great deal. I begin to feel myself giving out in spirit. I need so to rest where I could be contented. So long now my life has been one continued worry or excitement that I am losing my elasticity and I am getting almost afraid for I am apprehensive that I cannot uphold my position. Every day shows me more and more how this war is severing my old affiliations and making me lonely. Here I sit alone in this great camp, for so I feel, and the memory of my dear friends comes over me, and I am morbidly depressed. Indeed, I feel I am very small man, that I, may, I can endure no more. For I am well and not a prisoner, and have been honored far more than I deserve. I have not the heart of a good soldier. Again, Warren is going to be considered one of the heroes of the Battle of Gettysburg. 
and even he is beginning to show signs of having trouble coping with his wartime experiences. He's talking about how more and more of his friends are passing away during this war, more and more being killed. And he is left almost, he feels, alone. Warren, toward the end of the war, will actually be relieved of his command by General Sheridan. It's later, a later inquiry is going to find that it was mostly a political decision on the part of Sheridan, and that Warren did not do actually anything wrong. However, this is going to weigh heavily on Warren. And the results of this inquiry are actually not going to be published until after Warren's death. Warren is going to resign his commission as a major general of volunteers in protest in 1865 at the conclusion of the war. He's going to die in 1882, and at his request, he is buried in civilian clothing. And again, at his request, there are going to be no military honors rendered at his funeral. And again, this is a man who is considered to be one of the heroes of this battle. And even he is struggling with the effects of this war. Again, most men who return from the Civil War are going to find ways that they can cope with this. Some are going to find religion. Some are going to use humor to cope with their uh, conditions. A Confederate nurse named Kate Cummings wrote that treating men who had lost uh, wrote about treating men who had lost their limbs and how they used self-deprecating humor in order to move past this. She writes, "We have a room with seven men in it who have lost a limb each. It is a perfect treat to go into, as the men seem to do little else but laugh." She writes further that they told her repeatedly to encourage women to come see them, as they as they would make quote excellent husbands as they will be sure never to run away. <laughs> so again, these men are using self-deprecating humor to try and get past the conditions that they are suffering from, and also to make sense of what they have seen. As I said, some men will also find inc uh, more religion as a result of the war. James Williams is an officer in the 21st Alabama during the war. He's described as not a very religious man prior to the war. However, following the fighting of Shiloh, he writes to his wife, it will take me months to describe what I saw on that terrible field. The terrible scenes of the two days are in, uh, inedibly fixed in my memory. Soon after this, he begins to speak more and more of God. He feels that he has been saved for a purpose, and this is going to help him live a fairly normal life after the war. Of course, just like today, Veterans returning home from the war are going to turn to other, less healthy forms of coping. Some men are going to begin drinking very heavily. Others are going to become addicted to drugs like morphine or opium. However, as I say, most of these men are going to return home and live, at least on the surface, very normal lives. However, once again, many of these men may have been suffering from more mild forms of post-traumatic stress. We just don't know. So, very simple question, why does this matter? Just like today, the effects of war are going to go well beyond the battlefield, and they're going to come home with the men who fight these wars. In 2016, 6,000 veterans committed suicide in the U.S. alone. This is still a problem that is very much with us. While we may look at the treatments and the conditions that these men were treated uh, to, during the American Civil War and think how barbaric. I'm glad we have solved this problem. It is a problem that is far from solved. We also tend to idealize the American Civil War. We tend not to think about the deep psychological and lasting wounds that are going to be inflicted on these men. As I said, we don't know how many men struggled with combat-related traumas following the war. These men largely suffered in silence likely not even understanding their own condition. As I said earlier, the treatment of war neuroses is not going to change very much before the start of World War I. These men are going to be accused of cowardice, just like their Civil War counterparts, and some in the British military, as I mentioned earlier, are even going to be shot for cowardice. One British soldier during World War I is going to write a poem talking about how Shell shock 
soldiers did not receive the customary yellow wound strike on their sleeve that most British soldiers receive for being wounded in combat. He writes from a hospital while he's being treated for shell shock. Of course you've heard of shell shock, but I don't suppose you think what a wreck it leaves a chap after being in the pink. Perhaps you're deaf and dumb as well, but you don't get no gold strike to show, although you fought and fell. I love that last line. Although you fought and fell. These men are casualties of war. Oftentimes, though, throughout history, they have not been viewed as such. They've been viewed as something different. However, these men are coming home wounded, just like those who are returning with physical wounds. And the culture of the day in which they lived allowed them to be forgotten, simply cast aside and labeled as insane. Oftentimes, though, the stories that we can tell are just a fraction of the ones that probably exist. The last story I'm going to tell you tonight, I promise I'm circling for a landing, <laughs> is going to be that of William Fitzpatrick. He's also a member of the 48th Pennsylvania. He's going to join the regiment right at the start of the war in 1861. His is going to be one of these ambiguous cases. We don't know exactly what causes his death, but we can assume that perhaps the war had something to do with it. He's going to see combat at Second Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Petersburg, and countless other engagements. He's mustered out with the rest of the regiment in 1865. In 1860, excuse me, in 1871, he is living with his mother when he disappears from her home. She has no idea where he has gone to. She will place ads in several local newspapers begging for information in regards to her son, saying that he is not of sound mind and that he has not been since the war. She will ask constantly for information this ad will run in papers all over the country. On January 8th, his body is going to be discovered in the entrance of a mine shaft. He is found laying on his back as if sleeping. He had removed one shoe and one sock. He had also taken off his coat and carefully folded it into a pillow and rested his head down on it to sleep. He froze to death. It's early January. The question is, why did he enter that mine shaft? Why did he take off his jacket, carefully fold it into a pillow, remove a sock, a shoe, and one sock, and lay down to die? Was he drunk? Was he confused? Or had he simply had enough? Was he tired of trying to put the war behind him? The simple answer is, we don't know. And we will never know for sure. His mother is going to outlive her son by about 30 years. She will go to her grave, likely never understanding why her son left that night. So if you take nothing else away from this program tonight, I hope it will be one of the names of the people I've talked about here tonight. Because most of these men have suffered in silence. Most of them, their names are not remembered. So I hope you will remember one of them as you continue to explore Gettysburg and other Civil War battlefields. I hope that you will take a moment to think about those men who left something on these fields that they will never, that they never got back. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me on this campfire this evening. If you have any questions, please feel free to come on up. If you've had enough of me for one evening and want to run away, I did. Uh, please drive safe and enjoy the rest of your time here at Gettysburg. Thank you and take care.